playing on post-World War I oppression and a severe economic depression, Adolf Hitler turned Germany's despair into a plundering machine of mass murder. Soon after gaining control of Germany's feeble government, Hitler launched blitzkrieg assaults on neighboring countries. The German takeover of Czechoslovakia on 15 March 1938 and Poland on September 1, 1939 served as a dramatic announcement of Hitler's primary goal, complete control of all of Europe. Stunned by the rapid fall of Poland, the governments of Great Britain, France, Australia, and New Zealand, acting in concert as the Allied powers, declared war on Germany on, on 2 September 1939. While proclaiming its neutrality, the United States pledged unlimited support and began providing vast amounts of war material to the Allied powers. Knowing that involvement in the war in Europe could not be avoided, President Franklin D. Roosevelt called on all American manufacturing companies to rapidly increase war material production. During the early days of 1941, it appeared England might quickly fall to the German onslaught and leave the United States without any bases outside the Western Hemisphere. Consequently, the United States decided to develop an aircraft that could attack targets in Europe from airfields in North America. The Army Air Corps drafted requirements for a bomber with a 450 mile per hour top speed at 25,000 feet a 275 mile per, per hour cruising speed, a service ceiling of 45,000 feet, and a maximum range of 12,000 miles. The aircraft needed to carry 10,000 pounds of bombs over a radius of 5,000 miles, or a maximum load of 72,000 pounds over a much shorter distance. Given the available technology, they were very ambitious requirements. Requests for preliminary designs were released to the Consolidated Aircraft Corporation and the Boeing Aircraft Company on 11 April 1941. While Consolidated wrestled with weight limits and numerous developmental troubles, world events boosted the importance of the B-36. By the spring of 1943, China appeared nearly defeated by Japan, and neither the B-17 nor the B-24 had sufficient range to operate over the vast distances of the Pacific. Speeding up B-36 development might allow attacking the Japanese home islands from bases in Alaska and Hawaii. United States Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson authorized the Army to order the B-36 into production. A letter of intent for 100 production B-36s was signed on 23 July 1943 at an estimated cost of $175 million which was just slightly more than two days' cost of the war effort. B-36 development was soon delayed in favor of building vast numbers of Consolidated's B-24 medium-range bombers. Further B-36 development and production would have to wait until the war in Europe had ended. When World War II ended, the democracies sighed in relief and immediately disarmed, furloughed their troops, and destroyed their weapons of war. From 16 July to 2 August 1945, a meeting was held at Potsdam, Germany, where the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union agreed on the division of the Third Reich. After the meeting, it became apparent that the Soviets were intent on expanding their borders to prevent future threats to their national security. This meeting signaled the beginning of the Cold War. The experimental model of the B-36 was unveiled on 20 August 1945 and first flew on 8 August 1946. Big, big, big B-36 makes a B-29 look like a tin Lizzie, screamed one headline. To keep the media frenzy alive and the Soviets nervous, Consolidated then announced the B-36 would carry its own defensive jet fighters, as many as four of them inside its massive bomb bays. The relentless propaganda campaign was an unqualified success. The Army Air Forces effectively used the B-36 to intimidate the Soviet Union even before the first operational airplane had been delivered. The B-36 arrived on the world stage much, much like the Great Ape in the 1933 movie epic King Kong. 
Once operational, the aircraft was flown over many major cities to announce, both to our citizens and to Soviet spies, its readiness to defend the country. Once the XB-36 had been shown to the public, the Air Force consolidated and many subcontractors wasted no time placing full-page advertisements and publications worldwide to extol the capabilities of the B-36. Large photographs of the XB-36 in flight were published in newspapers, magazines, and newsreels in many countries. Radio news programs were replete with stories of the B-36 and its unheard of capabilities. The Air Force continued its propaganda blitz by showing off its new aircraft at air shows, political events, and by making low-level passes over many American cities at every opportunity, giving the public and Soviet spies a first look at the world's largest bomber. The continuing barrage of B-36 propaganda resulted in intense worldwide interest for anything related to the new airplane. Presidents, heads of state, politicians, journalists, entertainers, and various other publicity seekers soon learned that a connection with the bomber guaranteed an instant, free, and far-reaching spotlight in the world press. Prominent and not-so-prominent people alike began, began appearing in Fort Worth to tour the consolidated plant and the adjacent Carswell Air Force Base and hopefully to be photographed with the B-36. The B-36 was presented to the world as a larger-than-life machine fully capable of annihilating with impunity any enemy anywhere in the world. Both claims were not true. Due to the rush to fly the XB-36, normal engineering development procedures were delayed until after the airplane was flown. Once airborne, many major problems were discovered that threatened the entire program with cancellation. As development continued, so did claims about the unimaginable performance of the aircraft. The U.S. Air Force flew the new bombers over heavily populated areas simply to be seen, and seen in numbers and in diverse locations. Sequence numbers were scratched from photographs of the airplanes to not reveal the actual numbers produced. The subterfuge, however, produced the desired result. It bought time to develop the airplane into what it was originally intended to be through a series of modification programs. But it was the Soviets who were ultimately responsible for, cont for continuing the B-36 program. On 18 June 1948, the blockade of West Berlin began. The Allies needed a, a super weapon to stave off the perceived Soviet threat, and they needed it immediately. Unfortunately, the only super weapon available to Europe and the United States was a skillful use of intimidation focused on the new B-36, even before it was in full production. One week later, Secretary of the Air Force William Stewart Symington decided to continue the B-36 program in its entirety, since it was the only truly intercontinental bomber then available, and to not lose the industrial potential of the government-owned Fort Worth plant just when new production miracles might be demanded, such as they were after Pearl Harbor. With many World War II defense plants now closed and their skilled scientists and engineers dispersed into the general workforce, keeping Air Force Plant 4 at Fort Worth in operation became a national defense priority. Deliveries of combat-ready B-36A aircraft commenced on Saturday, June 26, 1948, as the first B-36A, named City of Fort Worth, arrived at Carswell Air Force Base at 2.30 p.m. on August 3, 1947. Within days of Curtis LeMay's takeover of the Strategic Air Command, the Air Force issued to Convair a 31 December 1948 deadline for delivery of 18 operational B-36Bs. At Air Force Plant 4, Consolidated Volte production managers shifted workers from all departments to the assembly line to ensure delivery of the aircraft before the end of the year deadline. Consolidated Volte Fort Worth Division Manager Ray O'Ryan held meetings with employees and told them the delivery, quote, is important to Convair, to the Air Force, and to the nation, end quote. 
He continued, it may seem remote, but delivery of this group of airplanes might be the difference between winning the peace or losing it. The statement was an obvious reference to the confrontation over Soviet-blockaded Berlin. On Thanksgiving Day, 25 November 1948, the first B-36B was delivered to Carswell, and the remaining aircraft were delivered before the end of December. The January 20, 1949 inauguration of President Harry Truman was the largest in U.S. history, even more lavish and outlandish than that of W. Lee Pappy O. Daniels' 1939 inauguration as, as governor of Texas. During the event, 40,000 people marched in a seven-mile-long parade of floats and performers, a mounted posse from Missouri, a herd of mules, and entire regiments of uniformed soldiers and armored vehicles. An estimated one million people attended the event. Above the pageantry flew a cover of military aircraft piloted by 400 cadets from Randolph and Barksdale Air Force bases, plus 100 women in the Air Force, WAF, pilots from Lackland Air Force Base. Capping it all was a rumbling cacophony that was heard all the way to Moscow, caused by a low-level overflight of five ground-shaking B-36s from the 7th Bomb Wing at Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth. All other events of that day paled in the shadows and sounds of the B-36 Armada. The B-36 earned its nickname Peacemaker by stopping one war and preventing two others. The blockade of West Berlin by the Soviets ended soon after the B-36 was displayed to the public. Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin realized he had no defense against the intercontinental bomber and its nuclear weapons. The Soviets then attempted to match and even overtake the technical lead of the West by developing developing their own nuclear weapons and advanced delivery systems. As a means of slowing the Western powers, the Soviets started a series of proxy wars in Korea, the Mideast, and Vietnam in order to divert U.S. military focus away from Russia. Hostilities in Korea ended on 27 July 1953 after claiming more than 50,000 American lives. The North Koreans had participated in ceasefire negotiations on three previous occasions, only to be followed by major military offensives. It appeared their peace talks were part of an ongoing ploy to win a military victory in the conflict by gaining time to rearm. To prevent a repeat of the previous trickery, one month after the truce was signed, President Eisenhower ordered Strategic Air Command to deploy B-36s from the 92nd Bomb Wing at Fairchild Air Force Base, Washington, to the Far East, visiting bases in Japan, Okinawa, and Guam. Operation Big Stick was a 30-day exercise that dramatically demonstrated U.S. determination to keep peace in the region and fulfilled Convair's stated purpose of the B-36. The ultimate purpose of the B-36 aircraft is to secure and maintain peace throughout the world. While war was raging in Korea, a potential threat to world peace was developing in the Mideast due to a challenge by Egypt of Britain's control of the Suez Canal. Egyptian President Nasser closed the Suez Canal to Israeli shipping in an attempt to evict Britain from the area. Egypt then threatened the annihilation of Israel with massive amounts of war material bought from Soviet Russia via Czechoslovakia. The ensuing conflict and the Suez War marked the beginning of numerous 7th Bomb Wing peacekeeping deployments to Britain and North Africa. These developments further explain why the B-36 was withheld from the Korean conflict and placed on standby in the Mideast through most of the 1950 decade. Ultimately, an unexpected force, the bank, overthrew the Soviet Union. Over the 40-year epic called the Cold War, the United States spent more than $8 trillion on defense, with $2.2 trillion spent during Ronald Reagan's eight years as president alone. The Russians simply went bankrupt trying to match this massive spending. Political ideology started the Cold War, and economic ideology ended it. <laughs>